that's okay. Um, I'm going to finish up Romans chapter 11 tonight and uh, get into the first part of chapter 12, which will be a good start for chapter 12. So, uh, can we get together? Uh, we finished up talking last uh, week in chapter 11 of Romans talking about ingrafted branches, talking specifically to the Gentiles, explaining to them how uh, a branch had to be cut off for them to be ingrafted into the olive tree. And it was all uh, word pictures for what it looks like to become a part of the body of Christ, to be accepted into the family by grace. There had to be a way for that to happen. And now... It also mentioned that uh, some of the branches that had been broken off were going to, again, have the opportunity to become part of the tree once again. The Gentiles were warned not to become arrogant about the situation, but be afraid. Remember verse 20. They were broken off because of unbelief, talking about the Israelites, the Jewish uh, people. And uh, you stand by faith, talking to the Gentiles. He said, do not be arrogant, but be afraid. This is, he's talking about the fear of the Lord. What we would talk, what we would say this, this day and age as the fear of the Lord. And the sad part, the sad thing is, is my personal belief is there's not very many people that either understand that what the fear of the Lord is about, nor do some even care to know what it's about. Which is sad because that interferes with salvation when you don't understand who God is. So, uh, after saying all of these things in verse chapters of uh, chapter eleven, after talking about the remnant of Israel and talking about how Israel's unbelief paved the way for the Gentiles uh, being offered grace along with the Israelites, we go into verse twenty-five. So he says, I do not want you, verse 25 of chapter 11, he says, I do not want you to be arrogant, excuse me, ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in the part, in part until the full member of the Gentiles has come in, right? So remember in uh, 9, 10, and 11, we discovered how God's sovereignty, meaning was talking about God's sovereignty in, in verse 9, 10, or chapters 9, 10, and 11, explaining how it's God's plan that salvation and grace through the blood of Christ would be offered to all, all people who would believe. And in that process, the Israelites would become hard-hearted or, or allowed to be hardened in their hearts. God would, God would do that. It says God hardened their hearts, meaning God allowed them to fall away so that the Gentiles could see the truth about grace, but also so that the Jewish, the ones with the hard hearts, would see the Gentiles come to grace and become jealous and desire such grace. Which in the end, all who believe will be saved. Right? So that's what he's saying. I don't want you to be ignorant about the mystery. I want, I want you so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part in part, not a complete irreversible hardening, just a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved, it says, verse 26, as it is written. And then he begins to quote um, uh, some Old Testament prophecies and promises from God. He says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Notice the covenant is when he takes away their sins. So that's Isaiah chapter 59. So when God says that to the Israelites or to Abraham in the beginning, basically the promise is I'm going to make you the father of many, father of many nations. And my people will come from your bloodline. And this is what led to the Israelites being God's chosen people for the chosen task of bringing Jesus into the world, in the flesh, so that he could die on the cross, so that he could become the savior of the world, the Messiah that was promised by God, 
so that grace through Christ could be offered to not only Gentiles, according to chapters 9, 10, and 11, but also, I mean, not only the, the, the Israelites, but also the Gentiles, right? So he's just reminding them, it's like, look, just because God hardened the hearts of these Israelites and there's only a remnant left, remember? There's only a few that remained faithful. Just because God allowed the hardening of their hearts to happen doesn't mean that they're lost forever. Doesn't mean that they can't one day see the grace and have their hearts softened again by repentance and belief, right? Okay, so just that's that's kind of where what direction he's trying to he's just trying to reassure the Israelites and and even the Gentiles that okay, just because God allowed some of many of the Jewish uh, people to uh, be blinded about the grace of God doesn't mean that it's a permanent situation that they could never be saved. And we should we should take great hope in that because that means even if for some reason yours or my heart hardens over time because of whatever happens in life doesn't mean that God still won't chase us down and give us opportunity to repent from those things and come back to him. This is also chapters 9, 10, and 11. Also good evidence that people can, in fact, be saved at one point, be God's people, and then choose not to be God's people. Make sense? The, the whole idea of once saved, always saved uh, teaching does not stand or hold water in these chapters because it's it's being described that there were people who were God's people and then they fell away from God, right? Then it, and if we think about last week when he talked about the engrafted branches, he gave the warning to the Gentiles that, hey, look, just because you've been invited in and engra engrafted into the tree doesn't mean that you couldn't be cut off again. Right? And just because you've been cut off doesn't mean you couldn't... Re you couldn't repent and be grafted back in. So don't think, and, be, and by the way, that doesn't mean that we can play spiritual Russian roulette with our faith. Today I'm saved, but tomorrow I won't be. Because I can be saved again tomorrow, the day after. I can just go back and forth. It's not a revolving door, basically. This relationship we have with God, the grace that's offered to us. It is there for the ones who believe that Jesus is the Christ, and, is, and, and the reality is, is if we're genuinely repentant, genuinely believe that Jesus is the Christ, there will be a growing desire to be closer to him in our hearts. All right. So as far as the gospel, verse 28, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. Talk about the Jewish community, the Israelites, those who, or whose hearts were hardened. Not the remnant, but the ones whose hearts were hardened. He says, they are enemies on your account. Enemies of what? Of who? If their hearts have been hardened to the truth of God, then you're you're an enemy of God. Here's the reality of what a lot of people in even today's world, even back in this time and even in today's world, is that people don't realize you're either with God and He's God, your God, and you serve Him as God. He's your God, or you're an enemy to the kingdom of God. You can't be not saved or not a Christian and still be a friend of God. It's not possible. The only way to be to not be an enemy of God is to surrender to the kingdom of God, which is through grace provided by Christ on the cross. It's the only way. And people don't like to hear that because it means they have to come face to face with the fact that they have offended a holy God, the creator God, God of all. And then they have to come, come to terms with the fact that because we have offended God, we have made ourselves enemy of God, against God, right? Because if you're, I mean, a friend of God would not offend God. A servant of the Lord, of God, would not offend the master. The offender is the enemy, the rebel. That's what the whole problem is. That's what the whole situation is all about. That's, that's, that is true as we learn in First 
second, third, and some of the fourth chapter of Romans, as we began this book, we learned that everybody is an enemy of God. That's why we all need Jesus. That's why Jesus came into the world, so that he could die on the cross and make sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice, to make payment for the offenses that we've committed against this holy God. Who loves us, by the way? He's not like so angry at us for offending him that he holds it against us and justly enacts punishment against us. He No, he sent Jesus to solve the problem and collect the debt at the same time. That's what's amazing about the gospel. God not only collected the debt, but spared his loved ones at the same time. Because the debt is life. Your life. Right? Romans chapter 6, remember that? The penalty for sin is death. Verse 23. The penalty for sin is death. And I, I, the way I think about it, the way I, first time I ever heard or had it explained to me in a Bible study setting, I've, I've sinned, I've sinned at, at least one time. I know I've sinned way more than one time in my life. And I only have one life. How many sins can I afford to pay for? And even that wouldn't be, I can't even afford the one because I'm not perfect. The sacrifice isn't perfect, so my offering isn't, isn't acceptable. So I, I have nothing to offer for any sins. That's why Jesus needs to come. Because Jesus was the perfect man. And the sacrifice for, for the sins of man is the perfect man. All right? So, he's saying, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. He said that God had allowed them to have hard hearts so that you can be saved, Gentile, so that you could recognize grace and choose to accept it or not. This is a lesson in how God works, if we're paying attention. Nothing is out of God's control. Nothing slips by him. Nothing surprises him. Like he didn't wake up in 2020 from his holy nap and say, whoa, where did this virus come from? Right? He didn't, it didn't happen like that. He's in total control of what he allows and doesn't allow, what he deals with in certain ways and deals with in other ways. So the question that we have to ask is, okay, well, how do we see what God is doing and how do we fall in line with it? How do we honor him? How do we get in how do we get on the, the kingdom of God program with all things in our lives? Whether it's uh, a national or worldly problem that we all deal with, or if it's an individual issue that only yourself or your family has to deal with, what is God trying to do here? And how do I stay in line with it? it says, but, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. He uses the word election because God elected the Jewish community, the Israelites, to be his people for the purpose of bringing Jesus into the world. Made promises to them which extend eventually, as we see now, to the entire world. Right? It says they are loved on account of the patriarchs. The patriarchs being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so on. All of Moses, all of those guys. All of the guys that the Jewish people, the Israelites, would be thinking about at the time that he's writing this letter to them. Like all those guys that you study under, all those guys that brought you to law and taught you the ways of God and, and taught you how to be God-fearing people that you should be following, they're the guys that God made the promise to, which extends to you because you're their descendants, right? It says they are loved on, the, on, on account of the patriarchs. On account they're loved, God still loves them even though he, he allowed their hearts to be hardened, even though they had turned from him. He still loves them because he made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis. There's nothing, this, this statement in verse 28 should tell us that there's nothing that we could do that would so offend God that he would stop loving us. Now, before we get running off with that idea, let's not go too fast. Because that doesn't mean 
that I can just go live however I want to live and God will, God's love will just cover all of that. Right? Now, people that go to hell, people that leave this world without Christ in their heart, without saying yes to the Lord, without believing that Jesus is Christ, will be, uh, they're, 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 they're living in an eternity without God. That's called death, spiritual death. That doesn't, God still loved them. Just because someone goes to hell doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It just means that they didn't receive the love that God offered. That's all it means. Because it's the same love that God offers to me and you. To any person that has breath, that has ever had breath, God loves them the same. No matter where they come from, no matter what language they speak, no matter what they look like, no matter what they've done or not done, no matter how bad they've treated other people or themselves, or how much they've cursed God, God still loves them the same. Because God is just, he's faithful, and he's perfect. And only God, only a God like that can find a way, create a way to receive the payment that's owed to him for the offenses of man against him and extend forgiveness for those same offenses. That's what the cross is all about. He did both things at the same time. Collected, his, collected what was due him. The penalty for sin is death. Collected that. And at the same time, forgave the debt. Collected on the debt and forgave the debt. All at the same time. That's the beauty of the gospel. And that's what he's trying to say to everybody in this, in this particular part of the writing. He's saying, look, the gospel can be for the Israelites and the Gentiles. It can be for those who were part of the remnant of Israel and it's for those who had fallen away. It can be for the, Jew, the Gentiles who had every opportunity to realize that there's something greater than them that created this world and respond to it or not respond to it. The gospel is the same for them. Grace is extended the same to everybody. So verse 29 says, For God's gift and his call are what? Irrevocable. This is, this is why people teach. Once saved, always saved, and the elect. About, they teach about what they call the elect. Meaning, if, if God calls you to be saved, you'll be saved, and, and no one can take it, and God won't take it. You can't lose your salvation. That's not what, it's, that's not what this is about, but that's what some teach using some of the scripture. And he says, he says for God's gift gifts plural and his call his gift is mercy forgiveness right and his call are irrevocable, irrevocable. in other words God brings Jesus into the world Jesus is faithful to what he came here to do he goes to the cross he's buried in the tomb he's resurrected which then uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 we read about the spirit of God coming on into the hearts and minds of those who are believers that Jesus is the Christ, Pentecost, and the gospel is beginning to be preached around the world and still is today. And the gospel is, is that God has extended grace to the sinner, mercy to the, to the offender. The gift has been extended and it's irrevocable. He's not going to take it back. I used to play that, I play that game all the time with my nieces and nephews. I try to give them something. Hey, you want something? Want a piece of candy? And I try to give it to them. As soon as they grab it, I, I snatch it away from them. Just be funny with them. Until they start to get mad, and then I have to give it to them. All the people look at me like I'm some kind of jerk. Right? But that's not the way God is. He's like, this is, this is my love that I'm offering you. No one else can give it to you. It's offered to you. All you have to do is accept that Jesus is Christ and it's yours. Accept what it is, and you can have it. It's not, he's not going to revoke it. There's nothing he's going to do, nothing we can do for him to revoke that away. No one will go to hell on a technicality. Think about that. Then he says God's, he says God's gifts and his call. His call to what? 
What are we talking about? We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about grace. We're talking about salvation. Call to salvation. Call to receive the gift. His call for all people, Jews and Gentiles, to know about God's grace and to know that it's available for them and their, their, his call to come and receive it. It's irrevocable. It's an invitation to salvation. And, and it's been given to every person that's either breathing or has been breathing in existence. And until Jesus comes back, it will still continue to be offered. So verse 30 says, just as you who were at one time, what, disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. It can get confusing if we're not paying close attention and following what he's trying to talk about. He's, he's simply saying that the reason that the Gentiles are able to see what grace is about and experience this grace is because the Israelites grew hard-hearted and God says okay we're going to offer it to the Gentiles then if you're going to reject it we'll offer it to them God is using the situation it's not like God said I'm going to pick the Israelites and they're going to be the ones who are saved and then he got caught by surprise because they didn't stay faithful to him he's like well I'll go find me some other people then if they, no, it was all in his plan it was all in his plan since the beginning that all would be saved or at least have the opportunity to receive grace. Right? So he says, he says uh, since, since their disobedience happened, since they grew hard-hearted and started to reject God, the, the Gentiles were able to see what they were rejecting. They were like, what are they rejecting? Oh, they're, they're re I can't believe they're rejecting that. If that was offered to me, I'll take it. Well, guess what? It is offered to you. It is offered to the Gentile. So, verse 31, they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. This is the old, uh, this, is, uh, this is really as basic as giving the same amount of ice cream to the kids so that there's no fighting and jealousy going on. That's what it is. It's the same amount of grace that God's offering to everybody. But because one, the Israelites rejected, some of the Israel, Israel, Israelites rejected it, they were able to notice that, wait a minute, the Gentiles are getting what we could have had, but we, you know, we, that what we rejected, maybe we shouldn't have rejected that. Maybe we, should, maybe we want that. Maybe this Jesus guy is somebody that is important to us. Right? There's nothing going to make you repent quicker than seeing somebody else be rewarded for what you passed up on. <laughs> when God loves somebody else in the way that's it's obvious that he would, wanted to love you, it's, it's so much easier to repent when your eyes are open to what the reality. What you, if you, in other words, once you realize what you're missing out on, you start to become, become remorseful or regretful. The good thing is, is God's love and mercy allows for repentance. That's why I say to people all the time, they say to me, they say to me, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know where God wants me to go? How do I know what school to go to or what job to take? Well, I tell them, I say, sometimes God, just go, just go do what you think God is leading you to do. And if it's not right, he'll tell you. Live the way God is calling you to live. And if it's not right, he will tell you. There's room for reverse. There's room for repentance. There's room for correction. And that's also true for the gospel. There's two, there's, I don't know how many people I've met in, 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 in the short time that I've been uh, saved and, and doing ministry compared to my entire life who think that they can never come back to God because they've messed up so bad. And usually it's somebody who was saved at one time and they've somehow fallen away or rejected God with their life or fallen off the rails and now they're not living for God and they know that they've messed up but they feel like they can't come back. And this is what he's talking about. It's like, no, there's always room. There's always room to make corrections. Of course, with God's help, we can make those corrections, right? 
I praise God for chapters like this in the Bible because it helps me stay encouraged. Because I know, and y'all know, that I'm not perfect. Right? And I make mistakes. And I might sometimes choose to do the wrong thing because it's what I want. Knowing that it offends God. That's what sin is. And in that moment of sin, anytime we sin, we become in that moment an enemy of God until we repent. So, verse 31 says, So they too have now become disobedient. Okay, we read that part. Uh, mercy result. Okay, verse 32 says, For God has bound all men over to what? Disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. God allows all of us to be turned over to our disobedience so that we can see the difference between living as an enemy of God and living in God's grace. Right? I think, I think in, in earlier chapters of Romans, we read that uh, God uh, gave the Israelites through Moses the law. This is what the, the Ten Commandments and the hundred other commandments that God gave us that nobody wants to talk about. Why? So that we would be miserable trying to keep up with God's commandments, knowing that we could never do it? Knowing that we're, uh, we're going to fail. Knowing that the scripture told us that if you fail at keeping one of God's commandments, you've broken them all. And then there's no hope. No, it's so that we would realize that we cannot earn our way into the presence of God by keeping his laws. And so that when grace comes, we would run to it as if our life depends on it. Because it does. Make sense? We, you can't. It's, it's, it's as simple as parents cannot discipline their children for breaking rules that they've never told them the, what the rules are. If you don't instruct your children what the rules of the house are, you cannot discipline them. You can't hold them accountable to it. So God brings in the rules for the purpose of making us aware that we are rule breakers, law breakers, which makes us enemies of the kingdom of God so that we would see the need for the solution to that problem, the invitation to be part of the family of God once again, no longer to be enemies because the price for the offense has been paid through Christ and repentance is available so that we can all be forgiven and we can all be in the family and, and not be enemies. Because if this isn't true, what I'm talking about tonight is not true. We might as well close the doors to the church and just go out and live like pirates. Do whatever we want to do because there's no hope for any of us. That's the truth. This is, this is what God has done for all of us, for every person in this world. God has bound all men, all people, over to disobedience, to sin, basically, so that he, what? may have mercy on them all. Understand that every person who receives God's grace and his gift of salvation, it's for the purpose of glorifying God. And if we see our salvation as something about, totally about us, 100% about us going to be in heaven with God, and there's nothing more to it, then we've missed it. Salvation is about God saying about every person that's ever offended him, which is all of us, saying, look, here's one right here that disobeyed me. Here's an enemy. Here's one of my enemies right here. Look what I can do in his life or her life. Look what, how I can change them and make them a part of my family because I'm merciful and I'm, and I'm love. And it glorifies him to save us from what we've done to ourselves. Then he goes in verse 33 and he starts saying this other, this other uh, poem kind of thing. And he says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and, God, and, and knowledge of God. You ever think about that? The depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You ever think about how much God knows? And how wise God really is? I, it, kind of, it kind of gives me a cramp in one side of my brain to think about that because there's no end to either one of those things. Just to even think about how far, would, how long, would, how great would that be? No, it's not even possible to understand God's wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable 
his judgments. Who's going to question God's judgment? Who's going to appeal his court? Who's going to say, maybe God got that one wrong? Right? And his path beyond tracing out. If anybody knows the way, it's going to be God. Then verse 34 says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Sometimes, sometimes we, we might act as if we do know the mind of God. Or, 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 or maybe sometimes we assume that God's mind is similar to our minds. Or he would think the way we think as, as human beings. But I can, uh, I, can, I can assure you that there's a 99.9999% chance that his mind does not work like our minds. Because he's perfect. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's God. Or, look what it says here in verse 34. In the rest of 34, it says, Who has been his counselor? Who's counseled God? Who's told God what to do? <laughs> nobody. There's nobody that's instructed the Lord or given God advice. God doesn't need anybody's advice. Why would any of us be qualified to give God advice? He's perfect and we're sinners. Just when, just when we're having a rough time with our relationship with God, we need to go to these verses right here. And so you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't have any business whatsoever questioning God about anything. Verse 35 says, Who, who has ever given to God what that God should repay him? Some bookie somewhere in New York? <laughs> that God owes money to, maybe? Who, who, who's, who's given to God? Nobody. God has, everything belongs to God. Nobody, no, God doesn't owe anybody anything. Everything is God's. It belongs to him. Verse 36 says, for, for from him and through him and to him are all things. And then it says to him be the glory forever. Amen. The, the reason he's saying verse 33 to 36, the reason he wrote all that down it's because he's saying in the end, he's explaining to the Israelites and to the Gentiles what grace is, who Jesus is, what the gospel is all about. He's explaining to them all the details as he understands them so that they could understand and receive the grace by, if it's their choice to do so. But he's, now he's saying, I don't even understand it all. I don't even know how it all works. I can't figure out how God put this master plan together. But it doesn't matter because he's God. All that matters is his grace is on the table and is to be received or not. And if if I have a problem with the Gentiles being saved, that's between me and God. Who am I to question him? Who am I to counsel him on who to be saved and who's not to be saved? Remember when we read a couple chapters ago, he said uh, to Moses, he says, uh, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Remember that? That was, that was the, the, the halfway through chapter 9. So that was the three chapters of him explaining the gospel thoroughly and really explaining grace and how it works and explaining why people need this grace, why we all need to respond to what's been offered to us. So then we'll get into verse 12, really, or chapter 12 really quick, and I'll just read a few verses and then uh, we'll get into it in deeper, the, we'll get into the bottom half of it deeper next week but the first verse of chapter 12 says therefore so therefore is that therefore is there in response to chapters 9 10 and 11 because chapters 9 10 and 11 is really all one statement and he says therefore because of this grace basically because of this grace because of salvation because god is great because you are an enemy of god but you don't have to be because of all that i urge you verse 1 of chapter 12 brothers in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Right? Wow. You see, this is where people get hung up. This is where people get, they leave themselves without any, uh, uh, 
how do I describe it? They don't give themselves a chance when they first get saved. Because they, they, they understand some reason, they understand that, okay, all I have to do is say that Jesus is the Christ and I can go and know that I'll be in heaven when I die. Because that's what we're all afraid to die, and we're all afraid of what that's going to be like. And we don't. We want to be. We want to have some some assurance, some feel goods, some fuzzy wuzzies that tell us we're going to go to heaven. But there's a purpose in our salvation. There's a reason God does things the way He does things. And if it was all about just me and you going to heaven or not going to heaven, then when we get saved, when we confess that Jesus is the Christ and we genuinely repent because of that, and we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, then boom, we'd go and be with God in heaven if that's what it's all about. But no, we stay here many times. What's the purpose of staying here if that's what it's all about? Well, right there it is. That's the answer. In view of God's mercy, in view of whatever was done on the cross, in view of God's love and his mercy and his grace, view of that, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Living, receiving Christ, Jesus is life. Studying that in John, the Gospel of John, in Colossians. He says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. The church, the body of Christ, the believers are the church. And if anybody's going to meet Jesus, it's going to be through the believers, through the church people the living sacrifices in other words I'm when I said that Jesus I believe that Jesus is the Christ and I repented of being an enemy of God I'm not gonna live like that anymore and I was baptized for the forgiveness of my sins I received a gift of the Holy Spirit I said to God in his kingdom I surrender my kingdom to you my kingdom will no longer exist and I no longer will be the king of it I surrender which is a sacrifice for the sake of God's kingdom and his glory. So I'm offering our, our lives, those who believe, as living sacrifice, meaning whatever God wants to do with my life from this point on, I need to be surrendered to it. I need to be ready for it. I need to be willing. And if I have trouble with that, I need to go back to the end of chapter 11 and say, who, who am I to question God? He says, uh, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. If, if, we would, if we were able to focus our minds on every day on what God must be thinking about our, the way we're living our lives, if we were able to focus on that all, all of the moments of our lives. I say I would say we would we would change a bit of the way we live sometimes. We would change how we do things and how we think about things and what we say. We would change how we react to other people, how we try to love other people. Now I'm not holy, and none of you all are holy. But this here says to live a life lives of sacrifice, uh, bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. How do I live my life holy? Totally. More and more every day, totally surrendering to Jesus, who is holy. To the Spirit of God, who is holy. Who, who happens to be residing within me, within any believer. The more we get tuned in, keeping in step with the Spirit, as we've read in Ephesians, or Galatians, or both. That's, that's, we're being made holy because God is holy. And it's not our holiness, it's His holiness in us. It's his holiness living in us. And that's what's pleasing to God. That was the whole story of Job. He told Satan, go ahead and test him. I have faith that he's going to be faithful to me. And he was pleasing to God. He, he honored God for the most part. He had to learn a few things in the end, but he honored God. Job did. Because God was his God. It says, this is your spiritual act of worship. We're going to do one more version that will be done. The spiritual act of worship. People in our world today, and I, I can't say too much for the world then, but today, 
Very few people think about the spiritual world that goes on. Very few people are living in the spiritual aspect of things. Because the world around us is so grand and so it's moving so fast and it's we're, we're in it and, and sometimes even part of it and, we, and we, we, get, we lose sight of what the spiritual things of life are when in reality the kingdom of God is all about the spiritual things of life making disciples is all about the spiritual things of life and if we live if we're, if we're doing that if we're offering our bodies a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God it would be our spiritual act of worship. We would be worshiping him with our entire lives, with who we are. And then finally, here's how to do some of that. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to what? The pattern of this world. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I'm not even going to say raise your hand if you're guilty of that. That's between you and the Lord. I'll tell you right now, I'm guilty of that from time to time. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. Don't do what the world says to do. Don't live like the world says to live. Do not, it's not about keeping up with the Joneses. It's not about fitting in and not being offended, offending somebody else. It says, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your people to get saved, you have to help them be renewed in their mind so that they can be transformed by the holiness of God. Being a Christian is about being transformed. It's not about saying that Jesus is a Christ, getting your free bus ticket to heaven and sitting at the bus stop waiting for that spiritual bus to show up and take you to heaven. That's not what it's about. It's about honoring God with your commitment to him because you believe that Jesus is the Christ and because you've repented of being an enemy of God. Because you notice that there is a need in your life for some grace offered by God, for forgiveness offered by God. Because you realize you've offended a holy God, the creator God, the only one who can save you. So, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and then it says then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing and perfect will anytime you want to know what the Lord wants you to do or how's the Lord leading you there it is, that's how you figure it out you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is why? because you're living a life turned over to his holiness. You're tuned into the Holy Spirit living in you. You're tuned in to the word of God. You're, you're understanding his grace and his mercy. And your mind is being transformed and beginning to work like his mind does. You begin to see the world the way God sees the world. You begin to see other people the way God sees other people, which allows us to love people when they're unlovable. Which allows you to be loved when you're unlovable. When someone sees you the way God sees you, because God loves you, even though you're an ex second dog sinner like the rest of us. And had every right to turn you out. And leave you out. But he loves you. So therefore, Jesus. Isn't that great? I mean, it's just like that's just like that. But too many people are so busy living in the ways of this world they can't even see the truth. But you know what? God is allowing their hearts to be hardened because he doesn't force himself on anybody. God, is allow, God will allow anybody's heart to be hardened if that's what they want. But some people are being saved because they're seeing grace. They're seeing the gospel. They're seeing Jesus for who he is. They're seeing God for the first time. And they're seeing that they're an enemy of him. And they're seeing their need for Christ. And the more people to get saved, the more people that have an opportunity to see this grace and maybe repent from their hard-heartedness, from their blindness. All because the believers are living sacrifices, living holy lives, pleasing to God. That's the beginning of chapter 12. Next week, we're going to talk about love. I mean, I think we've already been talking about love, but that's what we're going to, we're going to continue to talk about what love is. And then, and then we're going to talk about authority. Y'all ain't going to 
don't like that one. Not piss y'all, but y'all too. Nobody likes to talk about authority. All right, I love y'all. The Lord loves you. See you next week, chapter 12 and 13.